You're listening to Sustainably Geeky, the podcast for everyday environmentalists. Hi, you're listening to Sustainably Geeky, episode 58. Today, I'm really excited to be talking to Tim Keating, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer for Cemetery Wood, and he joined as a founding partner in January of 2022. Tim previously directed an environmental organization called Rainforest Relief for more than 25 years and became an expert in the demand for tropical hardwoods and the damage being done to forest to procure them, as well as wood and non-wood alternatives. He joined the Cemetery Wood team to research and recommend potential markets for the company and has been an integral part of the early production innovations as well as other aspects of the startup. So, Tim, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Can you, I guess, start by telling me a little more about um, your experience and Cemetery Wood and what you guys do? Sure. And thanks, Jennifer, for having me on the show. Um, So... Symmetry basically is uh, creating wood products out of something called bacterial cellulose. And I'm going to stick to what we've made public and is in the provisional patent um, and and keep it simple. So basically from a, uh, in a a very um, kind of encapsulated way, uh, we take bacterial cellulose and I'll describe that in a moment. Get a get a bunch of the water out of it because it's holding on. It holds tends to hold on to water very very much, and um, and then uh, add in a binder, various types of binders that we use, and um, all nature based by the way, no no uh, petroleum based products at all, and um, and then we uh, we mold it, we squeeze it out some more, get some some more of the water out. Uh, mold it, and, and we have various ways of doing that as well, and um, and uh, and then we dry it, and again, various we're using various methods to to do that, and once it's dried, um, it basically is, is wood in in effect. I mean, it's not tree derived wood, but it's very similar to the components of it are very similar to those of of tree derived wood. It's mostly cellulose. Uh, in fact, I'll, this is not a, a great sample, but some of the original uh, shapes that, that they were working with uh, ended up being, you know, discs just because they used, they directly used the material after it had, had um, filled up the, the, the top of a bucket and, and they were turning this kind of thing into, um, into jewelry pieces and, 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 and whatnot. So you can see it's, it's quite hard. I mean, I've, I've, I've bent this with my fingers many times and it just, you know, it's, it's not breaking um, from that kind of pressure at all. And, and, uh, and, and you can see as well, I, I don't know, maybe my camera's too dark, but it's got some patterning that reminded Gabe Tavas, the inventor of, of exotic woods is, was the term he, he was using. And um, so, you know, he was very intrigued by this and, started on this down this road to to try to you know uh finish making pyrus something that could be actually start to replace some of these materials um and that was that was when he was in college literally um and uh he's graduated since but um uh as you mentioned my when i got in touch with him um I had seen some of the media around his um, having won the Dyson Award uh, for this invention. And um, was I, having been working on tropical hardwoods, trying to reduce their their use um, for, I guess at this point, it's over 30 years, um, was very intrigued by what he, what was in the in the LinkedIn post. And I and I reached out, and got in touch, and 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 we started talking. And um, uh, I offered to work on a report uh, that uh, could show, recommend some of the um, some of the potential markets for this material that I thought would make the most sense for where their manufacturing was. 
at the time, and um, uh, and also because at this point we're 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 manufacturing smaller pieces of material, um, uh, you know what markets are out there for these high value tropical hardwoods that are smaller and. Um, so you know, we we eventually hit on targeting um, parts for musical instruments, which has been traditionally a huge uh, end use for a lot of these uh, tropical hardwoods, especially the highest value ones like ebony and rosewoods, which which interestingly have recently been listed on Appendix Two of CITES now, so they're considered endangered now even by international trade. Um, and uh, so, so that's kind of been our focus for the last year is, you know, can we, can we make the material, manufacture the material in such a way that it can be uh, useful for these parts of mus musical instruments such that the, the uh, manufacturers, of, man manufacturers of these instruments uh, might actually be, see it as a viable alternative. So that's what we've been up to. Oh, and I should say the bacterial cellulose. Let me let me let me just say where that comes from. So um, Gabe actually had gotten intrigued by um, because he was making kombucha himself uh, in in his college dorm, uh, as as the story goes, and uh, and he started looking at this what what is referred to as scoby, you know, and and if you know anything about kombucha then you're probably familiar with the term, but basically it's a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast is where the term comes from. And it's this, the particular bacteria that's in this SCOBY actually makes cellulose. So they build, they, they produce, they take the sugars and, and change it inside the cells of the bacteria and out comes cellulose, but it's a very, very specific type of cellulose. So bacteria cellulose is actually forms in tiny nanofibers as the bacteria make it. And then it all kind of, those fibers all kind of link up and that's where you get this like mass of SCOBY and it, and it's very water retentive. And the reason the bacteria do it is, is to create a kind of a shield for um, for them to, um, to block UV light. And, um, so they, it's very natural for, for them to do this. And as they build it, it gets thicker and thicker and eventually, um, gets so thick that the ones, the bacteria at the bottom are st start to starve for oxygen. So that's kind of the limit. And, and then the kombucha makers have to take that out, uh, and, and, you know, spread it out into, into new batches. So, this generates eventually SCOBY waste. And, and this is what Symmetry is currently looking at. So we're, we were actually in conversations with a number of large kombucha producers. And uh, the largest, in fact, we, we have come to a verbal agreement to utilize their, their SCOBY waste, which is actually quite a lot. And, um, uh, and, and turn, you know, eventually turn it into the wood material we call pyrus. Well, as a um, failed temporary kombucha maker myself, <laughs> I have seen these scobies up close and personal and um, <laughs> they are pretty gross looking. <laughs> Anytime <laughs> someone would come to my house and see yeah. this um, vat of fermented tea with a slimy disc at the top, they were like, what are you doing? And I had yeah. to explain. Yeah. It's actually, you know, it's drinkable. You just have to do like these three more steps. But um, I always thought, yeah, I wish there was a way I could use this. I would compost them. But um, mm -hmm. I would always try to get my friends to start doing making kombucha because I thought, well, I have a free right. scoby for you. This is like people pay for this. But um, yeah. I'm glad to hear that there are uses for it because it is an interesting little I don't know, ecosystem. And um, even though it looks gross, I could tell like a lot was going on in there. And it was, you know, really interesting that I was growing this little Petri dish on my counter. Um, 
yeah, I say failed because my kombucha tasted awful and I never could figure out the right measurements, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I think it's great that you guys are not only um, creating a wood alternative, but you're doing it kind of circularly. You're, you're using the waste from another product and right. basically it's not waste now. It's, it's being used for something. So yeah. And, and, and as the, uh, this, the, the early C, uh, CSO, my job partly is to keep us constrained on our initial environmental goals as a company, which is we, we really are hoping and focused on trying to make all of our production from various types of waste material. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, in the future, we may be looking at a lot of agricultural residues. Um, certainly food waste is at, at this point, initially what we would target if we start making our own uh, SCOBY, you know, our own bacterial cellulose. Uh, um, there, there's a lot produced in the U.S. And, and as I said, we, we're, we're talking to a number of companies, uh, but uh, in our projections of, of how much you know, production that we would like to have within, say, four or five years, we would have to start looking for other sources of bacterial cellulose in all likelihood, you know, starting to make our own. And um, in order to do that, we would, we would then turn to other food wastes as the initial furnish to, you know, brew in effect um, our own, you know, scoby. So um, yeah, we're, we're really cognizant uh, and, and, you know, Gabe, Gabe was there before I even spoke to him uh, uh, ever. And um, uh, it's, it's been such a privilege for me to, to be able to be working with someone who, you know, sees that, that vision. Uh, we're, we're, we're really um, love the idea of, the, uh, of just being part of the circular economy. Yeah. And, um, you know, people hear about all of these, um, I guess, wood alternatives being developed and to know that you can do it from bacteria waste is, is I, I would have never thought of it. So it's just neat to, to hear about things like this and know that people are working on these problems and coming up with solutions we never could have even dreamed of, you know, a few years ago. So I'm excited to see what's next. Um, <laughs> both uh, for, for you all and, you know, just in the industry as a whole, who knows what else is, is being developed as we speak. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but you, you kind of talked about this a little bit, but um, so Pyrus, this wood alternative you guys are developing, um, is it able to be used in place of all wood or is it just right now kind of being used for those specific things? So could I, you know, redo my floors with this stuff? Well, it's interesting you mentioned your floors because um, the, our second target after these musical instrument parts is indeed flooring. And, you know, ha having the experience I, I've had for running rainforest relief for, for so many years, uh, you know, my, my particular bent was to try to, in trying to stop, of course, tropical hardwood use, uh, I had to get to know the markets and, in addition to just getting to know the markets, I also was looking at those markets with an eye toward what would what would, what alternatives would work for these particular applications. And of course, every use, almost every use of wood we have in in the world has there are particular aspects of that application that certain qualities of the woods are desirable and other properties are not desirable. You know, musical instruments, I'll just use that as an example, but if you if you look at, f f say, the f a fingerboard for a guitar, you know, so this is the part on the, uh, on the neck that gets glued to the top of the neck, and it's usually the part you see, and which is one of the reasons why folks love these, um, you know, beautiful woods there. But there are other aspects of, of that part that um, are important as well. So obviously they want it to be durable in terms of the strings, you know, hitting the thing all the time. And, and, uh, and also uh, there are certain aspects of it taking on moisture from the air and whether or not that material is going to stress the guitar neck by, you know, 
bending it a little bit or uh, in either either direction, uh, in which case then you got to retune the guitar, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all particular aspects of the woods that are chosen, mostly for their sound quality and their aesthetics. But then these other aspects are properties that people would love if they didn't do that. You know, they'd love if they just stayed stable in terms of taking on moisture from the air and didn't expand and contract. So to answer your question, what, what we're looking at is um, how do we manipulate our material from the from right from the start such that we can manufacture uh, wood material that meets a various range of specifications. Um, so, for instance, if we were to, uh, you know, add in certain additives and things like that, we could come out with a material that would be very water resistant. If we were adding other uh, additives, we could actually come out with material that would be attract water like crazy. Um, so these are, um, you know, and then strength, you've got strength, you've got bendability, all these things. And every single application of wood has a different set of priorities, right? So whether it's a toothbrush handle or, a, or flooring, you know, flooring in particular, people have been led to believe that, well, the harder your floor, the better, you know, um, People walk in high heels, they drop things on the floor, they move furniture and things like that. So, so you don't want your flooring to scratch. You want it to be scratch resistant. You want it to be uh, uh, dent resistant. And you also would prefer if um, you know, it didn't take on moisture from the air either. So because you know, flooring shrinks and contracts, wood flooring uh, you know, shrinks and, and expands uh, with the ambient um, moisture in the air. So um, so these are all things that, that we are actively looking at and working on. And, um, uh, but, but second to musical instrument parts, we believe that flooring is, would be our next target market. And of course the flooring industry, the wood flooring industry is much, much larger than the industry for particular wood components of musical instruments. And so, you know, along with being able to produce a piece of flooring that is hard and can be, you know, can be coated with whatever the people want to use when 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 they put their floor in, um, and and gorgeous, uh, we uh, you know we we have to produce a lot of it. <laughs> so these are all things that um, we're we're excited to be looking at uh, because. The tropical hardwood part of the flooring market is actually quite substantial. You've got all sorts of woods out there that people are using for their for their floors. I mean, teak is an old is one that people used years ago and still use to this day. But ipe has grown in in um, uh, in popularity. But the biggest one is called Brazilian cherry, which is actually uh, a, 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 a marketing term that was that they came up with because people might not be as interested in it when using the, the name in, in the Amazon, Jatoba, uh, but that is the, the wood that uh, we call Brazilian cherry, and, and it's the single largest, um, you know, tropical hardwood used in flooring. And they're just wiping out the forest to get at things like Ipe and Jatoba and, you know, a couple of these other high-value species that will get them a thousand dollars for a log at the mill and yeah it's tragic so we're going to be we're going to be uh hopefully um coming out with some proof of concept um flooring pieces by 2024 wow that's great I'm yeah excited and, to see and, that. <laughs> and then you, you did ask uh, also if, if it could be used if pyrus could be used in for all wood products mm. There, there are definitely some wood products we, we don't believe we'll ever be making out of pyrus. doesn't really make sense for us to be making framing wood, like two by fours for home construction. These woods are, are incredibly undervalued and the industry has changed the face of this country in terms of its forests to grow these materials, most of them in plantations. And uh, 
that alone is is kind of tragic and people think these plantations they could they love to use the term sustainable or anything but um and um but because of that because of this industrialization of the production pyrus would likely never be able to compete with you know something like two by fours which are like eight bucks for you know an eight foot piece or 12 bucks at home depot and it's just um it, it it's going to probably take us more to make the material than we'd be able to to compete with that um really the the truth of it is people should be not using those materials in the first place for for framing wood you know um uh, i think that we really need to get back to more selective logging and treating forests differently than just lopping them down and then growing a tree farm uh so um and, and then getting, you know, and then those growers getting subsidized by the government because they call it sustainable. Um, it's it's kind of crazy that that's happening, but um, it's it's also not as bad as what's happening in the tropics when selective loggers are bulldozing brand new roads into the middle of the forest, hunting down one or two trees, mm. um, wiping out half the canopy to get to get at those one or two trees, and then moving on. This is this is the largest driver of, of um, deforestation, but people don't necessarily recognize that. But uh, so the amount of, of climate change emissions and biodiversity losses for say a, uh, an eat bay tree is far, far, far away, much greater, m many orders of magnitude greater than say for you know, a sudden yellow pine tree cut from a plantation. So, so we're, we're, we're focusing on these higher value, higher impact woods, uh, and hoping that people come around for the lower stuff, finding other materials that work better. Speaking of like ways that wood is used, um, what are some of the most common products or industries that wood is used for other than what you've already kind of talked about? So it turns out currently the, it, it, in terms of globally, almost 50% of the global wood harvest is going into paper production. And this is something that I think most people don't realize uh, just how big paper has gotten in the world. Um, you know, it, it wasn't that way just 60, 70 years ago. Even in the 50s, we were nowhere near producing the amount of paper that we currently produce. And this is this isn't just the United States. This is Indonesia, Brazil. I mean, it's happening uh, everywhere in the in, in the world. And um, so, not I'm um, not to say that you can't make paper out of bacterial cellulose because actually it turns out you can. But um, in in order to really address this issue, the loss of forests, people also need to be able to have a mindset that says the answer isn't only in other material alternatives. Sometimes the answer is just don't use it. Just don't use that thing. You know, just can we not go through a hundred rolls of paper towels a year? Can we not, or a month, whatever. Uh, can we not use paper napkins at our dinner table instead of, re, you know, reusable uh, cloth napkins and, um, all of these, all of these disposable paper products, that was, that was kind of like the first wave of the increase in paper production from the sixties into the eighties. And the second wave was printing and writing papers as photocopiers started to proliferate across the country. And then, uh, and the current, uh, increase in consumption is actually in packaging. And now of course we've got online uh, purchasing that has driven the use of corrugated cardboard through the roof. And so we have to really look at our paper consumption. And then second, one of the, uh, a, a huge increase in, in consumption of forests, uh, ha has very recently been, um, cutting these forests and, and grinding them down into pellets and shipping them overseas in terms of the southern United States, for instance, to the UK and, and other parts of Europe to burn as fuel um, because Europe for a long time was subsidizing 
um, so-called biomass burning as a green, uh, you know, energy source. And uh, nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> but again, these are the kinds of things that will drive a market uh, uh, increase. So when you look at um, those uses, and of course we have viscose fabrics, rayons, and um, um, you know there are a couple of other terms uh, for fabrics made out of wood pulp, and um, but in general they're called viscose. Um, and and this is a really big um, issue in Asia, for instance, um, and. Um, so when we, when we take those three out and we look at solid wood products, about, I would say about, the, the well, probably the majority by volume of solid wood products are um, used in construction. So when you look at, you know, building framing and uh, um, all, a, a number of other uses, it can be just even constructing a bridge, but then they throw the wood away. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, you've seen it, I'm sure, as you're driving around. Um, the majority of construction wood is actually softwood. So a lot of this is coming from those plantations I mentioned earlier that have been converted from old growth forests. You know, old growth was cut, it was clear cut eventually, and, and then um, and then they would put, put up these uh, tree farms, basically. So a lot of that is coming from there. And, and so when you get down to this uh, smaller percentage of wood consumption in the U.S. that is hardwoods going into solid wood products. That's where you start looking at flooring and um, uh, decking is, uh, I mean, there, there's softwoods going into decking. It's probably still the, the, the top decking material, but, uh, um, you know, tropical hardwoods have grown enormously since the early 90s as a, uh, as a home decking material. So um, that's that's kind of like in a nutshell <laughs> where where I see you know most of the wood uh, harvesting going uh, currently and and so our main focus right now is on these hardwoods um, that are coming you know mostly from the tropics very high demand material for very specific uses like like you know as I said musical instruments and flooring and then teching. I am very surprised at the um, amount of paper we're still producing in the, you know, quote unquote digital age, because you hear yeah. so many people saying, I mean, they don't want to print things anymore. And, and I, that's what I think of when I think of paper. I'm like, okay, so, you know, we don't need it as much. But like you said, I guess the disposable cups and um, paper towels and napkins and things and, um, you know, difference. and a lot of times the the cups, for example, are put forth as the greener alternative because, you know, there's a movement against plastic, rightfully so. But, um, yeah, you also have to think about the impact that the paper has. And in a lot of times they're not recyclable, right? Because they coat it with something or they're plastic, <laughs> yeah, plastic, which yeah. go figure that creates yeah. a whole other problem. But, um, but yeah, so it is interesting that people think they're being greener. I hear it all the time. Well, I'll use a paper bag or I'll use this or whatever. Right. It's not right. actually. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it, you know, a good example of that is you, you look at some of these ta uh, takeaway containers, and I remember seeing that at, when Whole Foods was first on the scene, that they had gone you know, at the salad bar, they had paper containers. And it uh, turns out that they were either plastic coated, and then later on, uh, to, to get away from this extra plastic layer, they uh, often now... I, I won't say this saying necessarily that that uh, the boxes at Whole Foods were 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 such, but um, they they started coating a lot of these takeaway containers with, in effect, Teflon, you know, sprayed on. So you've probably heard of PFAS, and 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 which is a general term for these uh, um, fluorinated compounds that uh, are are used at, uh, to create water barriers. So. I mean, I can't even tell you how how much of the food packaging, even just like wrappers for a sandwich or whatnot, are coated with these materials. And of course, they go to the landfill, and now all the landfills are having a major, major problem with PFAS, and and it's you know tar tar being targeted by you know legislation in the U.S. and whatnot. But it's tragic, and uh, so you know, bottom line, I think is very often we just have to 
bring your own container, <laughs> you know, which is which is what we do. And, and, and um, we get all these accolades from servers, but it's like, well, why, yeah, but I've been doing this since the 90s. Why, why, why aren't you doing it too? You know, it's just like a bit of a no-brainer that we, we should avoid all this one-time use, you know, packaging. Yeah, for sure, especially... It's literally right up against your food, like you said. The yeah. Forever yes. chemicals. Ugh. Well, right. um, okay, Good so here, here's the the big um, the big one. Now we've we've kind of touched on this a little bit throughout the conversation, but deforestation and um, mm. I, that's a big been a big part of your your life's work. It sounds like. Yeah. Um, so, what I guess first of all, what is it? But also. Um, why is it problematic? You know, it's, I mean, we, I think we usually hear of it from a climate change perspective, but there's also a big biodiversity component to deforestation. So can you kind of give us the, you know, the quick um, kind of overview yeah. of this? I know it's a big topic, but. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think to answer that, I, I, I want to preface it with, with my own personal experience. And what drove me into this, I, you know, when I was when I was young, uh, probably before 1970, going out into the woods, um, I started I started, of course, you know, noticing all the wildlife. And when I was when I was really young, even out the back window of our suburban home in New Jersey, you know, I was fascinated by by birds, and eventually my my dad put a bird feeder you know, adhered to the back window of the of the den, and um, I I was I was hooked, you know. Uh, the but for me as well, it wasn't just it wasn't just oh these cute little things are fascinating, you know. I started learning about these animals and catching on to certain things, spending hours watching them. Um, that really gave me insight into the natural world in ways that I think a lot of other people at the time didn't bother looking at. And so when I did go out into the into the woods, which um, there were small patches just half a block up from our house, um, I started <laughs> I started doing things out there that kind of really set me apart from most folks. I mean, I was like. At the time, getting my dad got me a subscription to Ranger Rick magazine, which was you know the I think National Wildlife's um, uh, you know magazine for for young kids. I remember and, those. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, man, I gobbled that stuff up, and I and, and so I kid you not, it was Ranger Rick where I uh, magazine where I first learned how to maybe splint a, a bird's foot or something, you know. And, Kids would bring me later on when I was a teen. Kids would bring me injured birds from around the neighborhood and whatnot. And um, but but before that, I, I started making plaster casts of animal tracks and stuff like that. You know, out in the woods, and I and kept them in my room and identified various animals um, in the books uh, based on those and 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 created a map of the woods where I found these tracks. You know, so I was basically a budding naturalist and. Um, the thing that when I started reading about and finding out about polar bears and bald eagles and things like that, um, you know, this the idea of one of these animals going extinct to never, ever be on the planet ever again, mm. to me was so profoundly disturbing that I, I kind of, you know, set that as my as my main focus in life. And later on, after even graduating college, starting to find out details about the loss of tropical forests, having gone from, you know, just being focused on wildlife in the U S and, 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 and paying attention during college years to helping bring back the, um, the, um, peregrine falcon to the to New Jersey that had been extirpated because of losses, uh, the inability to reproduce because of DDT. Um, to to then 
get hit by this wave of information suggesting that deforestation, the loss of these forests, was driving such major, major numbers of extinction that, you know, when you took when you took like the polar bear and the bald eagle and and and, and projected that reality to the tropics, it was overwhelming. I mean, it's just like, well, what was the point of saving these big iconic animals when, when we're probably, according to the numbers at that at that time, probably losing a thousand species a year to extinction in the tropics? You know, turns out that was an unbelievable underestimate. But you know, just thinking of that, um, you know, in my, uh, I, I guess, late twenties was hard to hard to take. So I ended up when we started Rainforest Relief, for me, it was it was a necessity to try to stop this de- tropical deforestation. And looking at the problem as someone who who was already aware of the costs of materials really put me on a um, a path to get down to the single what I what I what I found to be the single greatest material, destructive material I could I could identify that I had a way to do something about. And so we made tropical hardwood consumption our, our number one focus with, for rainforest relief. And that it came at us uh, early on, right after starting the group, we heard that Atlantic City had gone out to, to bid for, you know, tropical hardwoods for their, for their boardwalk, re, uh, for a boardwalk replacement. And, um, so that's, that's what set me on that focus. Um, and, and, and for those 26 years, that's, we, we stayed focused on that. We, we, we worked on other materials as well, bananas and chocolate and all sorts of things, but our main 80, 85% of the work we did was, was, uh, focused on tropical hardwoods. When I, when I moved into New York City in 95, I, I learned in 94 that the Coney Island Boardwalk indeed was also made of tropical hardwoods. At that time, they had, sh- they had shifted, uh, um, but it wasn't the entire boardwalk system yet. And um, so that became my focus, uh, just get New York City Parks Department off these materials. So in terms of uh, deforestation and extinction, there is no question that the loss of tropical forests is the single greatest cause of extinction on the planet. And what we're let, let me just let me just give you a sense of where we are in terms of awareness of what we're losing, how quickly in terms of biodiversity loss because of the loss of these forests. A scientist uh, that for much of his career was uh, um, a senior scientist at, at Smithsonian Institution. His name was Terry Irwin. He recently passed, by the way, just in the last couple of years. And um, he did a, he did some work uh, in the 1990s in tropical forests, trying to come up with an estimate of how many insect species there might be on Earth. And to do that, he looked at the um, type of insect that seemed to have the greatest number of species. Uh, beetles, it turns out, are apparently very popular uh, for for Earth. <laughs> apparently, our planet loves beetles. So, um, so we went to the Brazilian Amazon. It was a place he he thought would have a, the greatest diversity of of beetles from all the work they had already done. And he did something that no one else had done before. Everyone else uh, prior prior to him was looking to count insects. They would go up into the canopy either with a balloon or climb, climb up there and with a net, you know, try to trap some insects and whatnot. With the balloon, there was even a balloon. They sat down on top of the canopy and they captured insects. He decided to try something else because he wasn't he wasn't um, satisfied with the results these people were getting. He wanted to know exactly or as best he could, how many insects might be on one of these trees, how many beetle species. So he actually fogged a tree, a big emergent tree in the middle of the Brazilian Amazon lowland rainforest, and killed all the insects. Now, people might, you know, there were plenty of people who thought this was quite controversial, but 
you know, they laid tarps down, they fogged the tree, it rained insects for three weeks, and then he and his team proceeded to count the beetles. And this first tree they did, oh, it took them months and months to count the beetles. And they came up with a number of beetle species. This isn't individual bugs. This is beetle species. Around 1,450 species of beetles on this single tree, 80% of which had never before been cataloged by scientists. So this is why he did that because everyone else was getting a portion of the 20%. You know, 80% suddenly this one study, they've got, you know, scads and scads of beetles. And that's just beetles. Or winii. <laughs> just beetles. That's not like mosses and plants growing on it or depending not, on it or not, other bugs or not birds. Flies, or anything. Not flies, not, <laughs> uh, um, you know, bees, not butterflies, none of that, just the beetles. In one tree. So in one tree. So he went 50 meters into the forest, found another big tree, fogged that tree, counted beetles, came up with about 1,700 species of beetles on that tree, 80% of which were not the same as on the other tree 50 meters away. He triangulated to the third tree, and this is thankfully the last one, but he found on that tree something around 1,500 species of beetles. 80% of which were not on either of the other two trees, just 50 meters away. So the first study, the first result with this one tree blew the entomological community away. The, by the third tree, what he was starting to expose that no one else could ever have uh, you know, assumed was that across the tropics around the globe, you could go perhaps five football fields away and be surrounded in that five football field space by possibly a thousand species of beetles found nowhere else on earth but those five football fields. So a thousand species, not a beetle species, but a thousand species. And so if you start to extrapolate that around the tropics, your mind just breaks and, and it's like, could could we really possibly be looking at that level of biodiversity among insects on Earth? And so he estimated ultimately that there may be 30 million species of just insects on the planet. And that estimate is twice as much for all species, by most, most accepted by, by uh, you know, life science scientists uh, around the world. So it's currently assumed we maybe have 15 to 17 million species on Earth. And what he's suggested was, ah, yeah, that's laughable. I think there are more like 30 million species of just insects. And, um, and, and now other research came to light in the mid 90s, people started to look at microorganisms and it turns out that they're not common around the world, that indeed they have this level of biodiversity or even greater. So it is possible that we, we're looking at 100 million or even, even more than that species on Earth. And yet we're just buzzing down these forests, you know, for things like decking. So this is, this is really what drove me and, and what continues to drive me. And, and I just think, you know, who, who are we to, to do this? How can we see this is okay? You know, we actually share this planet or we not really we don't anymore but we you know we do and 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 it is our job it is our role on earth now that we have this power to wipe it all out uh to protect it and you know hand it off to the next generations of not just humans but everything else on earth with this balance that that has been created over you know a billion billions of years well, and a lot of people, I think, hear about cutting down trees and they just think, well, plant new ones, duh, like what's the problem? But these these ecosystems are hundreds and thousands of years in the making mm -hmm. and they're so intricate. You can't just plant a new tree and expect it to, you know, immediately have the same effect. Like like you said, they're, they're planting these plantations in parts of the world, but they are monocrops and they literally only grow one type of tree that doesn't live that long. And these trees need right. hundreds of years to develop the, you know, the habitat for these 
thousands of right. creatures and things, and it's it's tragic. Just two quick examples. You know, an ipe tree in the middle of the Amazon, on average, they're 250 to 1,000 years old. So that's the, those are the trees we're turning into decking. And in order to get at that tree, and they grow intermittently in the forest, it's not like you go into a pine grove, you know, and everything is an ipe tree. Ipe trees grow one or two individual trees per acre. And um, so to get at them, they need to use that bulldozer to push a, a road, right? You know, a skip trail right up to the tree. And they're just like going around based on some back of the napkin drawing that some scout uh, gave them. And they're like, oh, we know there's another Ipe tree around here somewhere. Let's go this direction. No, no, it's not here. Let's go there. And the roads that they put in with these machines um, are the kill off about half the canopy. One study in Brazil showed 30 trees uh, are killed in order to get at one mahogany tree in this way. And, that, and, and I've talked to the scientists who did that study. He said it would apply to Ipe as well. And um, so... You know, we're losing half of the forest to degradation to get at a single tree that's going into our decking. And then if you go to British Columbia, where Western red cedar is an incredibly popular product for, you know, siding and, and soffits and things like that, the architects love it. It's gorgeous. There's no question about it. But the trees are 1,800 years old, sometimes 2,000 years old. And... You know, we, we were we were in British Columbia back in 98 and I took a photo of 22 people sitting on a Western red cedar stump all at the same time. I mean, that's how big this thing was. And we we count we started counting rings and we got up to 800 and then lost count because we didn't have a magnifying glass to, to count the remaining rings. But we were only halfway through the stump. And so this was probably a 2000 year old tree that we were all sitting on that had been cut for cedar shingles for siding people's houses in in you know maine or something and 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 it's just senseless because how do you grow another three another two thousand year old tree you know cypress down here in florida um the, some of these trees were three thousand years old that they cut in, in the 1800s and now it's gone you don't there are no more well there may be five or six <laughs> 3,000 year old cypress trees left in, in, in this country. But um, uh, that's what that's what went into all the all the cypress decking and cypress siding back in the 1800s into the early 1900s. And now it's done. And, and it's like and it's not that it's done. Oh, we've replanted more cypress. Sure, there there's young cypress around. But you can't use it for decking. It's crap for decking. It's crap for you know siding. It's 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 not a good quality material at that when it's 25 or 30 years old. It's only when they're a thousand years old that it's good quality material. So we're just white. We're just going around consuming up the old forests for these kinds of products. And I don't care how much you replant. It's never going to be the same. The forest isn't going to be the same, and the product isn't even going to be the same. It's going to take another thousand years. Yeah, and and there's just so many ecosystem, you know, functions that these trees cause outside of that. I mean, they keep, um, you know, erosion from happening, and it, on the coastlines, the mangroves really ha play a big part in the coral, you know, spawning and all that. And it's just it, when you start looking at each individual type of tree and forest, it's like, you know, yeah, there's no way we can replace this, even though we replant yeah. a tree, you know, you've yeah. already taken out the, the the main job. And and there's also yeah. a public health, um, I think, argument for keeping forests around. I mean, there's a lot of medicines that come from the tropics that we haven't yet even discovered or that we can't re recreate, you know, synthetically. And there's even arguments that COVID-19 may have, you know, been accelerated or released um, from the forest and into, you know, livestock that was kind of grazing too close by. So I think if, even if people aren't worried about biodiversity for biodiversity's sake, there's a lot of human yeah. implications. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, we, we know that, you know, HIV AIDS was, was transferred from chimpanzees, uh, most in all likelihood due to the, um, you know, the trade in bushmeat. Um, as these forests were 
further and further intruded by loggers. Uh, the loggers would even help the bushmeat uh, hunters. Uh, they would, you know, they they the hunters would hop a ride with with the loggers, and w while they were out in the woods hunting bushmeat, they would bring bring some back to the logging camps as well. And uh, so the loggers would be happy to have the bushmeat hunters uh, happy to give them a ride to to their logging camp, uh, so they could hunt. And uh, you know. I mean, so much of what we're what, what we're losing and what we're doing to the world, you can tie to wood consumption. And, and you know, there are tendrils everywhere I look and have looked. And um, yeah, an incredible, an, an incredible story. From I guess it was you know the '90s as well. They they had this this person who who a scientist who who uh, would would hunt for plant material for the national institutes of health to test for biologically active compounds that could eventually be turned into life-saving medications. Came back from Malaysia, from an Asian trip with some stuff from Malaysia. The NIH lab tested what he brought back, he had like 100 samples of various um, plant material. And uh, one of them they found was incredibly effective at stopping HIV from becoming AIDS in, a, in the Petri dish. And so they said, we, we're, we're gonna need to test more of this stuff, go get us some more. So we went back to Malaysia and went to the forest where he'd found that and it was gone. The forest was gone. And he hunted and hunted for a while and could not find that plant again. So, you know, this kind of thing is not, it's, it's not the only story like that, but, um, you know, it's a good illustration of what we're losing as we continue to just, oh, for money, somebody, somebody cut that forest for, you know, to bring all those trees to the paper mill, the nearby paper mill. It's like, oh, great. So what's more important to you, that um, copy paper or that you, you know, a relative of yours might die from some disease that could be could be fixed with something from these forests, you know. As another great example, even in here in the Pacific Northwest in the United States, they they um, they found an incredibly effective compound uh, that can um, prevent eighty percent of a particular type of uh, I think it was ovarian cancer, if I'm not mistaken, and um, if caught early by using this um, this drug obtained from the bark of the Pacific yew tree. And it turn, turned out that the Pacific yew trees are smaller trees that grow under the canopy mostly. When, they, when the loggers would come in and clear cut the area, the, 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 the yew trees were just pushed aside and burnt. <laughs> so, so suddenly, like all these big trees going into some sort of, you know, two by fours or whatnot, and the, and the Pacific U was too small, so they just uh, considered it slash and they would burn it off. Um, turns out that there was more money to be made by saving all these Pacific U's than had ever been made from, from the logging, you know, um, as a potential drug for, for cancers. So anyway, you know, just a couple of hor horrific examples of, of what, we, what we lost. Now, fortunately, they found another way to make that um, that particular drug, but uh, but not the other one, as far as I know. So, yeah, we are much more dependent on nature than it is on us. Like, yeah, nature would be fine without us, but we definitely need all of these different things it provides. Um, well, before we move on, um, real quick, can you just talk a little bit to I think what most people think of when they think of trees, which is the carbon sequestration, you know, plant a tree to help reduce global warming, blah, right. blah, blah. So right. um, it, yeah, can you speak about what you know of that? And e maybe even um, your your thoughts on uh, when you hear people talk about the offsets using, you know, planting trees, is that right. truly an offset or is that problematic in ways people might not know? Yeah, about? yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, and, you know, like, like almost everything, there, there, the answers are are nuanced, right? Planting trees is a is a good idea, but we have to be careful. We we don't want to go suddenly planting trees where trees weren't growing before. That's something that um, you know is uh, unfortunately 
some people are eyeing places, say in Africa and whatnot, that oh, we're going to just start planting forests here um, and uh, and to get the carbon credits, you know. And meanwhile, <laughs> the pastoral people there uh, graze their animals on the, in the grasslands, and uh, and you know, very often these these grasslands they, there there might be a few trees uh, as well. Um, they're already um, and um, but it, it's not it's not just a forest uh, of of nothing but trees, and so that's something that doesn't make sense. Looking for carbon sequestration, what we really need to do is first stop destroying the forests, the old forests that exist. There needs to be a moratorium on wiping out those forests. Period. That that because. What are those forests doing there? Actually, it turns out that the absolute best means of pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. They've been doing it all along, uh, putting it into the soil in general, um, and they're still doing it. But when you go in and disturb that forest and, and, and disturb it to, an ex to some great extent, the forest then actually starts releasing that carbon out of the soil and, and, and certainly the, the trees and even, believe it or not, the animals are, are you know make up quite a large part component of carbon in, in that forest and when the forest is disturbed the animal populations go down and what does that mean well they're dying and they're <laughs> releasing their carbon uh, and, and and the understory uh, is reduced and all all the carbon in that uh, um, gets lost so it's a it becomes like it's happening in the Amazon now they're very close to a tipping point where, the entire Amazon will be a carbon emitter rather than a carbon sink because of all the deforestation. So um, that's the first thing. And um, but in terms of the losses, you know, again, I'll, I'll, I'll just point to these the reality of logging these tropical forests because what, once the road is put in by the loggers. A logged tropical forest has been shown to be eight times more likely to be completely deforested than one remaining unlogged. So once that road is there, then everyone who wants to, you know, cut trees down to grow farm crops can get in. And that's what moves the frontier forward. It turns out now we are in this incredibly horrific point where scientists are now saying that the core of the Amazon has been breached by logging roads. So that is to say that the deepest parts of the Amazon that are way beyond the deforestation frontier have now been entered all the way by loggers. And again, once, once those roads are logged, once the, I'm sorry, once the forests are logged, because they bulldoze roads up to those trees and the landing areas to get them out, eight times more likely to be completely deforested. And one other study showed that something something like, you know, 20% of a logged forest is completely deforested in the Amazon four years after logging. So we, we really have to stop supporting the loggers by pulling our demand for, for, for these tropical hardwoods that are coming out of these places. Do not believe the companies that are saying these materials are sustainable. It is complete fabrication. And I, I, I don't care, you know, what the company is. And I can name names, lots of them. That I've had a, plenty of experience with, um, you know, there are very, very, very few instances of people cutting trees in the tropics in a truly sustainable way for export. You know, locally it's more often done, but if you're getting into the export market, you know, you're, you're not being sustainable for the most part, probably 99% of that is not done sustainably. So when you take the degradation from the logging and combine it with the ensuing deforestation, you actually have more than 30% of climate change gases coming from defor deforestation and degradation globally. And the main driver of that 
are those logging roads. So this is this is why I've been so focused on tropical hardwood demand for so many years. Well, okay, so we've, I think, kind of established that wood is not the um, great renewable resource that it's, you know, promoted to be. Um, it can and be. It, it can be, yeah. The way we're doing it now is not. Um, right. So what are some ways that people can uh, reduce their overall consumption of wood and wood products? I mean, given the given the stats of where wood harvest is going, I, I think the the top one is, you know, really reduce your consumption of disposable paper products and paper pro products in general. And it's interesting because my my dad was actually in the paper industry and it was quite an interesting discussions that we would have when I was starting to get into forest conservation. But um, uh, that would be, I think, something that everyone can do. Everyone isn't necessarily going out to buy tropical hardwoods, although it's extremely common when people are looking for flooring and, 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 and you know common products like that. Certainly, if you're putting in a deck do not use tropical hardwoods. Uh, get in touch. Send an email to EarthBuilt, and I will I will help you find a, another material that's going to work for you. And it's probably end up being cheaper, and it'll probably end up la lasting longer. Um, and um, so, in terms of uh, paper products, you know, reduce your consumption, and and please, please, for Gaia's sake, just recycle every piece you use you know get make sure it gets into the recycling bin the right recycling bin and a bin that actually is getting recycled um, because we currently at this point corrugated cardboard corrugated cardboard what they refer to in the industry as OCC may be at somewhere in the 61 to 66 percent uh, uh, you know recovery in the United States so that sounds pretty good, right? But what about that other thirty percent? We're still throwing cardboard away. Uh, that that's insane. I mean, most of the country has access to curbside recycling, and and recyclers love corrugated cardboard. It's a very high value to them. So make sure you get all your cardboard and all your paper into the in, into the recycling system. Um, yeah, isn't uh, unlike plastic. Um paper and cardboard are, are much more recyclable for longer, right? Like you can recycle them a few more times at least than plastic, which is like one well, and done if that. <laughs> it actually depends now because, because when you look at certain plastics, they have come an incredibly long way in the last two decades in terms of taking uh, plastic that say makes up a, a, a water bottle. As long as it gets into the system, that, that water bottle will end up in a bale that is going to be sold to a recycler, a plastic recycler, and that and and then once it's sorted, that plastic bottle can literally be turned into pellets, good clean pellets that can go back into making another bottle. That is possible, and plastic actually um, degrades less during recycling than paper. Uh, so the problem isn't that uh, you know. Plastic can't necessarily be re-recycled numerous times. Problem is not enough of it is getting into the recycling system. And that's where we've, we've, we fall short. Paper, on the other hand, in terms of corrugated is high. Numbers are high, but printing and writing paper is way, way, way down in the 20s in terms of recovery and utilization. So on average, we're still somewhere around 35 uh, percent uh, recycling of all paper in the country. And more and more of our paper, I mean, just look at packaging and how it's changed. More and more of our papers on labels and, and, and stuff that is not going to be recycled, period. You know, I mean, I practice extreme recycling. I literally soak off labels and peel them off. And, you know, I try to get all the paper I can possibly off any packages that we that we buy. And um, and even using um, TerraCycle for certain really, really difficult to recycle uh, parts, but um, uh, that's that's job one, I think, for for people. We want the circular economy. We've wanted it. We've talked about it for years and years. We could, used to call it recycling. Now it's called the circular economy. Well, we still have this opportunity. We have a much, much, much greater opportunity to participate in that than before. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, we 
we had we had to go around and collect bundles of newspapers and and give them to the Boy Scouts, you know, in order to actually participate in recycling. There was no there was no curbside recycle. It was only came about in the late '80s in New Jersey. So um, now it's like almost everywhere. So we can do it. It's just are we are we you know committed or are we lazy? Uh, you know, do we care enough? to actually go take a couple of moments uh, extra in our day to, to make sure that they're, you know, this pizza box, <laughs> they can make another pizza box out of it instead of cutting more farms, you know, um, because that's the reality. Um, it turns out that paper can, in general, most of the studies uh, sh really show that we probably need about 15% of new fiber in the paper production system if we're to you know fully increase recycling to the point of when we get up upwards of like 90 percent so we're going to have to find that fiber somewhere but the reality is that we don't have to find it from trees at all agricultural residues we generate hundreds of millions of tons of that a year and it's really good long fiber whether it's wheat straw or corn stovers or, or the gas from the you know sugarcane milling and uh, so 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 those fibrous plants, the parts that we don't use that we usually throw away or burn or, or send to the landfill, make great paper. It turns out, so that's where we get our new fiber, and the rest should be you know recycled fiber. And we never, literally, never have to touch a tree to to make paper ever again. So that's, I think, first. If you are going to buy wood products, get in touch with EarthBuilt. Check out what's left of the Rainforest Reef website. I mean, the, the, the stuff is out there. Um, but, um, you, you know, uh, there, there are certain things that are just 100% avoid. But when, it, when, you come to, when you come to domestic hardwood species, it is possible that, that they're coming from almost truly sustainable logging, especially here in the East. Um, we have the Appalachian hardwoods uh, that, that are pretty sustainable. Uh, you know, so you, you want a piece of furniture? See if somebody, uh, uh, you know, in the East is making furniture out of Virginia oak or something, you know, and uh, it, is, it is out there. You just got to look for it. How um, difficult or easy is it to get a hold of reclaimed wood for house projects or whatever? Yeah, it's getting easier. I mean, I, I dealt with for a lot of years, and he's, I consider him a friend, uh, the largest uh, uh, wood reclaimer uh, in the Northeast. And um, so, you know, you need some custom product made. You need some cabinet facing or some flooring or whatnot, uh, um, and you want it out of reclaimed. Armster Reclaim Lumber, great place to go uh, to, to get a quote. Um, you know, I, I, I think that part of the problem, and th this is actually changing. There are companies that make like stick up um, uh, interior paneling and stuff like that out of reclaimed. And so it's become a, more small companies have gotten into getting to the point of where it's like industrialized. Like you can go online and they'll ship you a carton of, you know, stick up paneling that uh, is, is all made out of, out of reclaim. So we've definitely got, gotten uh, some improvement uh, along those lines in terms of availability, but we're nowhere near where we should be. How many buildings are demolished a year in the United States and they're just crushed, they're, they're, they're you know, blown apart or they're knocked down, they're crushed and they're moved into the dumpsters and they're hauled off to the landfill. That is a tragic loss of good resources that can be uh, util used again, whether it's bricks or wood or steel or concrete. So um, uh, yeah, definitely look for reclaimed um, and uh, you, you know, you may have to custom order. Uh, in fact, EarthBuilt, we're, we're, uh, we're able to uh, provide this gorgeous, gorgeous river recovered Cypress right now that is just in, in my opinion, it's very reasonable for, for what it is. I mean, we're talking about, you know, 1800 year old cypress trees that are, that were, are now being pulled up from the bottom of rivers where they have sat for a hundred years, um, kind of lost in the old, early, in the old logging. 
uh, of the Southeast. And um, so it's a, you know, it's a great resource and people can actually have what is in all likelihood the single most outdoor durable wood that ever grew in the United States, you know. Um, and, and, and it's and unique. Never and cut, it's never cut diff- another tree. Yeah, and it's unique oh, and different. It's gorgeous. Oh my and you're, god! So, so you're like, yeah, you're not getting something everyone yeah. else has when you're you're reclaiming yeah. or recycling or using these alternative woods and stuff. So, yeah. Well, um, something I saw on your website that I wanted to touch on before we we end is um, the slow wood movement. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in effect, slow wood is kind of everything I've been suggesting uh, in in response to your questions. Um, It was a concept that came up for me a number of years ago, um, being so much involved in alternatives for, you know, destructive woods and, and then getting I won't say involved, but from the outside watching the slow food movement, it occurred to me, I can't remember exactly when, but wait a minute, you know what, if I just change one letter, (laughs) we're talking about a system of looking at uh, consumption of forest products that uh, we can mimic and utilize some of the um, concepts in slow food and apply them to wood and um, forests. So rather than it being, you know, farm produce or production and buying local and being mindful in your production and using seasonal and whatnot, uh, in this case, it's also buying local, but, but looking at the forest, not as purely a, um, you know, just a farm of trees that you're going to go in and take, um, but, uh, an ecosystem that supports hundreds or even thousands of species of other life that every little disturbance that, that you create in that forest is going to upset that balance, at least for a time, if not completely, you know, wipe it out. And, um, and then, and then look at the product as well. So being mindful, being slow when it comes to wood has also to do with what, you shouldn't use, you know, this is one of the things I think that, uh, you know, slow food was mostly focused on what, what you should use, right. What you can use, what you can find, uh, that's local and sustainable. Uh, but there's another aspect of this kind of, um, system where people for some reason are loath to, say, well, I can't use something, you know, and that's really antithetical to a lot of the impetus of this country as a whole, you know, um, it, we, we've, they've turned us into consumers. When's the last time you were referred to as a citizen? You know, even the, even the president of the United States talks about the American consumer. How many people, how many, pre, how many presidents do you have to go back to hear a president refer to the American citizen. You know, what does that mean for us in terms of how we see ourselves? So when you start talking about avoiding buying something, you know, it's kind of like, wait a minute, well, you're, you're, you're gaslighting me. I don't know. Uh, that can't be, that can't be real. I can't survive without, you know, buying stuff. Well, so buying things is patriotic. I mean, just look at <laughs> after, after nine 11 and you know, that was what yep. we were told to do, right. Go out and get the economy back on track. And, uh, yeah. Had a similar photo op, right. Let, let's run out and buy something. And, um, yeah, a pair of socks, I think the first time, and I forget what the, what, what the, you know, Bush junior was, but, um, yeah, this is this is an this is exactly right. It's it's un-American not to buy things, right? Uh, and 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 we really have to rethink that. What is this? What is this country but a conglomeration of of land ecosystems? You know, really, shouldn't we be shouldn't we be looking to protect that legacy instead of just converting these all these ecosystems to stuff? that we end up then sending to the landfill anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, slow wood is really 
looking at these wood products and with an eye towards where did they come from, whether it's, you know, whether it's that, you know, back scratcher or that flooring or, um, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. And certainly the paper, uh, which, by the way, I haven't met a piece of paper yet that truly qualifies as slow wood. But um, so it's kind of off the list. But um, uh, so this is the other thing is, look, we love wood. We love to be surrounded by wood things. Right. And this is one of the things that ties us to our original home, you know, trees speak to us and the, and wood speaks to us and, 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 it, and it brings us joy and, it, and it, aesthetically, we're just very much attached to it. We will take wood over plastic. We will, you know, we'll, we, we'll buy wood furniture and think it's the greatest thing, you know, it's cause it's beautiful. Wood is beautiful. There's no question about it. So how do we, how do we bring that mindset to the way we, uh, cut forests to the way we shop, to the way we, to you know, we 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 consider the origins of these materials, and also how we dispose of them, or or how we keep them and hand them down to our children. You know, these are these are really really important things. It's, that's that's the bottom line is understanding the true value of wood, and for me, the true value of wood is. The forest, right? And I think that is originally why we love it so much. Yeah. Well, you've given us a lot to think about, and um, just I could go on and on about this stuff for for days. But um, I know I know we're we're starting to kind of get close on time. Um, are there any anything else that maybe we haven't touched on that you want to you want to touch on real quick or? Well, I would just say um, for, for for folks interested in in what Symmetry Wood is doing, check out the website symmetrywood.com. Uh, you know, find us on LinkedIn, uh, Symmetry Wood, and um, reach out. And uh, we'd love to hear from folks, and we'd love to keep you updated on developments. And uh, you know, when indeed we'll be able to hit the market with various um, you know wood products. Um, and if folks are interested in just currently looking for other alternatives to the most destructive woods, uh, certainly send an email to earthbuilt and that's E A R T H B I L T dot com. Um, and, um, other websites I, I would say uh, are packed with good information. Manga Bay is a great site. It's got tons of articles about you know, of course, about rainforest. Um, I do think they could stand to get a little more hard hitting looking at, uh, um, you know, selective logging in the tropics uh, in, in their re reporting. But um, and then you uh, environmental investigation agency, EIA.org, I think is probably what they um, they both sites are. Uh, they're in the UK. They're also in the US. Um, they have some really, really hard hitting investigative reports about logging and other wildlife trafficking and, and, and whatnot. So that's a great site as well. And finally, the um, Global Forest Watch is if you really, really, truly want to get a sense of how quickly we're losing forests, they have they have uh, maps that you know go back in in time and you can do these like video of of watching the losses in the last couple of decades and it's just stunning i mean heck you can even do it on uh google earth you know you can run uh three four five um shots from satellites of even from the 80s uh over various areas of the world and just watch the forest disappear and it's and then and and then you know it'll help you picture just exactly where we are and i use this term often but most people avoid using this term uh, for everyday what's going on every day in our in our lives but our loss of forests has reached the point of it being cataclysmic and when you when you look at this that the fact that we've entered the sixth mass extinction on the planet since life began on earth and that the one that humans are perpetrating is happening faster 
and deeper in terms of the loss of phyla of living organisms than all the others, including the ones 66 million years ago that wiped out 75% of life on Earth when an asteroid has hit the planet. This one is happening faster than even that. And this is all because of us wiping out ecosystems to make products or to grow crops. And uh, so when you, you know, when you, when you look at that and you, and I, th- I think the loss of biodiversity on this planet qualifies as cataclysmic, you know, because the fact of it is we are go, we are going to push earth into a tipping point where the planet is no longer going to be able to sustain us no matter what we do with our technology. And, you know, that's the reality of being a part of nature and dependent and as dependent as we are from all these things we get from the natural systems. So you, hopefully not to just leave it on the, on such a, you know, dire note, but um, this is, this is the truth of where we're at and we really, really need to step up our game. No, it's, um, it's scary sometimes, but sometimes that's what we need. We need to, realize like this this is a big problem and we can't just you know smile and act like everything's fine (laughs) when the world is literally burning our house is burning down so um okay well before we go um we do a uh, segment called the green life hack so this Mm. is just where we give our listeners one thing that they can do um, to live more sustainably or to educate themselves so do you have a green life hack for our listeners well, you know, I, I, I've, I've suggested a number of practical things that, that people can do. And, 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 and I apologize that mostly it's, it's like what not to do, you know, which I think people, you know, find that mm, uninspiring perhaps. Um, uh, but it's still but, an action to not yeah, do something. Yeah, avoiding is not as, is <laughs> not as fun or interested in, interesting as buying some alternative, you know. It's but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, not to buy something. But I would say, uh, rather than I don't know. I guess this this is a life hack. But rather than um, hacking something we do, I'm I'm going to suggest hacking how we think, because it turns out um, all my life I've been seeing my place in the world differently than most people in modern society. Now, I didn't know that's why I wasn't popular or I didn't fit in when I was young. Or, um, but, but it turns out that was what was going on for the most part. And so, and I also more recently in life learned some way to, uh, to frame this verbally. Uh, in, in terms of the, the way I look at the world differently than the way most people in society look at the world. So it turns out that we, if you, if you put words to it, we as a society have been trained to believe that earth belongs to humans. And everywhere you look, and an author who described this uses used the term mother culture, everywhere you look in our culture, you see people behaving this way with this mindset or uh, actually outright um, honoring this mindset. You know, hey, oh, this guy, let's give him, you know, give him an award because uh, they figured out the best way to log a forest more efficiently, you know, so let's, or give this person an award, an award because they were able to take their startup making purses out of leather, you know, to going from uh, a a three person startup team to a a million dollar a year company, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Everywhere we look, this mindset of earth belongs to humans is being played out in front of our eyes, even from the moment we're born. Um, but but, But the way I have come to understand that I've always looked at the world is the opposite that humans belong to earth. And when you really start thinking about that, okay, so here's the hack. 
if you, if you actually believe humans belong to Earth, there's one little thing you can do in your, in your thinking that can help solidify this sense. Stop calling the planet the Earth. <laughs> because our planet, actually, we have come together and agreed that our planet has a name. Now, sometimes it's, it's in different languages and whatnot. But the name of the planet across the globe is agreed that it's Earth. The Earth objectifies our planet in a way that supports the sense that we own it. So I have practiced for, for maybe the last 20 years or so in my head to translate. Every time I hear someone saying the Earth, the Earth, the Earth, I translate it into Earth, drop the the, and certainly don't drop the capital E. So you see in writing all the time, people talking about the planet and they write the Earth with a small E. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's not the name of the planet. The planet has a capital E, you know. But um, like Mars, do we ever talk about the Jupiter with a small J or the Mars with a small M? No, you know, we don't even refer to Mars as the Mars. Why do we call it? the very planet we're part of, the Earth. Well, because the name came from dirt and soil. And when we realized we're actually, well, you know, part of a planet, it, it, we just kind of brought it with us. But you know what? We, we really need to repeat in our mind, Earth. Every time you hear the Earth or you're going to say the Earth, just say Earth. There is no need for the the ever grammatically. Uh, it turns out because, you know, it's not the Susan or the Jennifer, except for maybe one person that I won't, that will remain nameless. <laughs> um, that is interesting. Yeah. I, I don't even think uh, I realized, you know, subconsciously that people do that. It, it is just so built into our, our psyche to save the earth, save the earth, you know. Yes. Save um, earth. Right. Save yeah, earth. which the earth, the earth, it's a will being. Be earth is a grand being and it, yeah. and it deserves not to be objectified. It deserves to, well, we need to personify the planet and you know, respect it as bigger than us. We're just a part of it. Let's use mm -hmm. its name properly, you know. Yeah. And once you do that, and the reason I say that is once you do that, once you start to refer to and thus think about the planet as a being, it changes everything. We can't treat a, uh, our, this grand being of which we're a part as if it's just like, you know, an object to be, to be uh, abused and forgotten and, mm -hmm. you know, pushed aside. Yeah. Well, I that's definitely um, something I can work on as well because I, yeah, it's it's like a mind mindset shift, like you said. Yeah, it's a mind hack. Um, You'll see how it changes <laughs> uh, the way you the way you look at the planet. Well, my uh, green life hack isn't quite as profound, but hopefully it will help <laughs> people in in kind of shifting their mindset in a way. Um, it, mine is just a couple of books I've read recently. Mm. Um, one is The Hidden Life of Trees, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. And um, it's, it's really just everything, you know, that you want to know about how trees live, how they communicate, they do communicate, and how they are interconnected. And just, I mean, the largest living object on the planet is, you know, connected to trees. And, and anyways, I learned a whole lot and, um, it's a very cool, interesting book. And then that book actually kind of helped me with a book I'm reading now, which is called the overstory, which is a fiction book, but a lot, I see a lot of the same themes in there and they talk about, um, a lot of the stuff you learn in this nonfiction book. And also, um, you're learning about the protests, um, in the eighties, seventies and eighties, you know, to protect the redwoods and the old growth forest in the U S and Canada. And, um, you're just, you know, hearing about these, the experiences of all these different people in, how they came to be, you know, tree huggers for <laughs> the, the term that, that people like to use. But um, yeah, both books, very interesting, uh, make you think a lot about, you know, our relationship with nature and trees in general. So um, yeah, yeah, so those are my life hacks. Check out, you know, 
those books or other books that, that maybe are on your radar that may help, help you understand forest and trees more, more um, intimately. Um, well, Tim, thank you again so much for being on the show. Um, one more time, do you want to plug where folks can find uh, you and or Symmetry or, yeah, find your organization on yes. the interwebs? It's, it's <laughs> symmetrywood.com uh, for folks who want to, um, you know, check out what we're doing, uh, creating uh, Pyrus uh, uh, as an alternative. And uh, if folks want to get in touch with me, uh, the best way to do that is just send an email to info at earthbuilt.com, and that's E-A-R-T-H-B-I-L-T. Um, and I can, you know, help you find uh, great alternative materials or truly sustainable wood materials for whatever project you have in mind or whatever purchase you have in mind. Um, okay. And, um, yeah, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Symmetry is also on LinkedIn, and that's a good place to get in touch with us as well. Okay. Well, you can find um, me personally on Instagram and Twitter at Het's Gonna Be Me. And um, I'm also, or the show is also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, um, YouTube, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. So please subscribe, share us, like us, give us a five-star rating, thumbs up, whatever you're inclined to do. Um, if you have ideas for future guests or topics, feel free to reach out to the website or any of those channels. Um, thank you again, Tim. And for everyone awesome. listening, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Jack.